Okay, hello everyone. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Today I will be speaking to Michael Roberts. Michael, Michael is a Marxist economist and activist. He blogs at thenextrecession.wordpress.com and has written extensively on uh, recessions and on the Marxist theory of crisis. So Michael, thanks very much for coming on today. Nice to be here, Jonas. So um, as we all know, we're facing a massive cost of living crisis. Um, everyone can see the sort of steep increases in prices, particularly of energy, uh, which following the lifting of the energy price cap has risen by over 700 pounds a year for some people, plus the price of petrol and also of essential food items in addition to that. And this isn't just happening in the UK, it's an international phenomenon that's happening across the world. And in your writings, Michael, you distinguish between uh, two basically mainstream views, you call them the monetarist view and the Keynesian view, where one basically argues that inflation is due to excessive money supply, which is caused by um, central bank injections into the economy. And the other argues that it's due to excessive demand caused by full employment or uh, excessive fiscal stimulus and some combination of those two factors. Uh, could you sort of start off by explaining your position on this debate and how your view kind of differs from both of these perspectives? A very good uh, summary, I thought, Jonas, of, the, of uh, both the situation and the arguments presented in what you can call the mainstream economics or from the big institutions and governments that present the arguments. I mean, as you say, we've got a major inflationary shock at the moment. Uh, prices in the shops or the consumer prices in countries like the US, UK and across Europe are rising at five, six, seven, eight percent a year now, which we haven't seen those levels of increase in prices on a yearly basis uh, for 40 years, 30, 40 years in most countries. So this is a serious situation. Uh, wages are not keeping up with that across the board. So it means that in after you've paid for the extra prices, you've actually got less money, uh, real wages on average are falling in these countries. In fact, there's been an estimate from the UK that if we continue at the same levels of inflation as expected during the year, and we continue to accelerate at the moment, then there will be the biggest fall in real uh, wages and living uh, conditions for the average British household for probably 60 years, uh, which shows how serious this situation is. Of course, it, what we might discuss later on is whether it's going to last or not. But uh, clearly, during this current year, we are seeing a significant rise in, in inflation of prices across the board uh, in most countries, generalised, concentrated in energy and food, but generalising to the other parts of your shopping basket as well. Um, and that's going to cause a big fall. Now, as you say, Jonas, uh, what are the explanations for this huge uh, spike up in inflation. Well, uh, I think anybody can see if they're looking at their energy bill today uh, in the UK and other countries. Uh, and as you say, we've had a huge increase from April and the so-called price cappers have been hiked uh, by uh, the local uh, our energy companies in the UK or privately owned or owned actually by state companies in other countries, Germany and France. Um, who run our private uh, network of uh, energy distribution and, and so on, uh, they've, hi they've hiked their prices by a massive amount, on average, I think 57%. It's expected if uh, we continue with the level of oil prices uh, we have at the moment, that there'll be another huge hike of another 30% in October. So uh, between beginning of April now and next April, unless something changes, most people's energy costs are going to double. Uh, and if you think about that for the poorest, poorer sections of our community, this is a serious situation. This is, we haven't seen this level of energy disaster uh, for decades and decades. And it means, luckily, we're going into the summer at the moment. But if we continue into the winter, even so, we're going to see people who could well die uh, from the freezing conditions at their own. And because they're unable or unwilling to put on their uh, heating systems, which are often inadequate, particularly in the poorer communities. So a, this is a really serious situation, but you, you can see from that, that what's the fundamental, or at least the, the initial basis of this inflation spiral is to do with the shocks we've had with energy, uh, big gas in, uh, prices and, it, and oil price rises, and also in food, because 
as you uh, across the board, there's been a sharp rise in price of basic grains and other food commodities. Uh, according to the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, they have an index of average food prices globally. It is now at the highest level it has ever been. And that means not just our prices in our shops in, in the advanced capitalist countries uh, rising, we can see that when you would go to look at your shopping basket rising all the time, but more seriously, or certainly even worse, in the uh, so-called global south or the emerging so-called emerging economies that rely heavily on grain imports, Egypt being one example, but large parts of Africa and other parts of the world, these countries are having a dramatic hit to their living standards with the rise of food prices and so on. But these are the two areas which have been driving the inflation up to now, although it is generalizing out to other parts of the uh, spending that households make. Um, so for just from that, Jonas, you can see that it's, it's mainly at the moment a supply issue. In other words, there's a lack of cheap oil, cheap gas, or at least lower priced food and so on. It's the reduction in production of food. Uh, there's plenty of production in oil, but it's been hit by uh, the Ukraine-Russia war, partly, but also a general uh, drive up um, in, the, in, in the prices of these commodities because of a uh, reduction in supply and control of supply. So it's been a supply shock in my argument. I think the same argument during the COVID period uh, of the slump in 2020, that it wasn't so much uh, excessive demand that started to drive up prices, but it was the fact that production stopped. Everybody was forced to isolate or they were in lockdowns and whatever. So we had a big reduction in uh, production. And that has affected global supply chains. It means we haven't restored the ability to transfer commodities, things that we need around the world through ships, containers, and so on. They've all got congested, blocked, and there doesn't seem to be any significant improvement in the supply chain blockage, which has built up over the last year. So that drove prices up, plus the war, of course, in Russia and Ukraine. So I've given you a long answer so far without dealing with the arguments presented by the mainstream and the agencies about why is inflation taking place now. If you'd like me, I'll continue on that, unless you want to jump in, but otherwise... No, yes, no, please continue. So uh, if you can see that's a supply shock, then it doesn't really fit in with the arguments presented in the mainstream about why there's inflation. And as you very correctly said, there are two main approaches to causes of inflation that are presented in mainstream economics and among the uh, official agencies. The first is the so-called monetarist theory. And the argument is that inflation is entirely a monetary phenomenon. What do we mean by that? That's a phrase used by Milton Friedman, a Chicago economist of the 60s and 70s, who said that inflation only happens because central banks inject huge amounts of print or create too much money beyond the actual growth of the economy. So the money supply rises faster than the growth in output of commodities being produced. And when that happens, it's too much money chasing too few goods, prices will rise. So the answer, uh, according to Friedman and the monetarists is, what you need is the central banks to intervene and uh, squeeze the money supply down or make it more expensive to borrow. So you drive up interest rates in order to reduce the use of money and the, of spending in that area using money, and then uh, the balance will be achieved again. So inflation is being caused by monetary injections, but that doesn't hold water for, for a number of reasons, particularly just reality. If we look historically, since say the uh, early 1990s, inflation rates have been gradually falling in the major economies. And yet, as we know, there's been huge monetary injections being taken place by the central banks into the economy with a series of economic crises, 2001, 2008, 9, and of course the COVID slump. What the reaction of central banks and governments has been to pump more money into the banking system to keep the banks from collapsing and forget, trying to get the economy to move forward. Uh, but at, during that period, on the whole, inflation has been slowing, not rising. So 
The monetary phenomenon argument doesn't seem to hold. What has happened to all this money? It's not gone into raising prices in the shops or, or in buying uh, goods and so on. Mainly, it's gone in to speculation in the stock market and the bond market. It's, a, it's become a financial phenomenon that this huge monetary injection has been used by the banks and other financial institutions to, speculating, uh, to speculate in financial assets. And so it's in huge rises in the stock market and the, and the bond market and other financial assets and above all, also property, housing, house prices have rocketed, but not uh, on the whole prices elsewhere. And so the monetary argument just does not hold. What that tells you, uh, if you think about it, is that if uh, boosting money supply doesn't really affect inflation much for various reasons, then reducing money supply and increasing interest rates, which is what the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank and other central banks are thinking of doing and planning to do this year will not necessarily solve this inflation spiral because this monetary approach is not the answer. Now, the other side, other argument is that are the Keynesians. The Keynesians say, uh, yes, that's completely wrong. Friedman and the monetarists are totally wrong. It's not to do with money. What it's to do with is the, the real economy gets too uh, utilize it. Too much full employment. Too much full employment is the position of the of the Keynesians. Once everybody's got a job and they feel they can change jobs, then they they've got the incentive to try and boost their, their wages. And uh, so the danger is that what, what happens in in this situation when there's relatively full employment or low unemployment is that wage rises rise and uh, the owners of companies that employ these people have to increase their prices in order to compensate for that. And particularly if they're in a good monopolistic position, they can force up the prices. And so that way you get what they call a wage price spiral. And empirically again, let's look at it. Uh, there was a, a theory or a, a empirical uh, paper produced back in the 1960s by a British economist called Phillips. And he said, look at the trade-off. If uh, unemployment goes towards zero, wage rises and price rises go, to go up. And then if unemployment rises, price rises subside. It, this was called the Phillips curve, which for a while in the 60s was regarded a, as a complete explanation empirically validated by uh, this uh, Phillips curve. But in fact, the Phillips curve is no curve at all. If we look at the last 40 years, the Phillips curve has been flat so that uh, when unemployment goes down towards zero, which it's been doing on occasion since the 1990s, there has been no huge rise in prices at all. Uh, and certainly no huge rise in wages. Wages have been pretty much static uh, in the major economies, certainly in real terms, for the last 30 years. So the, the Phillips curve is not curved, it's flat. It's not delivering what the argument of the Keynesians is, that the wage rises causes uh, price rises. Nevertheless, it's a great argument used uh, in, uh, in traditional circles. The governor of the Bank of England, uh, Bailey, used it recently when he said there's a real danger that wage rises will cause uncontrolled inflation, implying that what, we, what you workers out there, what households out there, having facing 8% increase in inflation, should not look to boost their wages to compensate for this because they'll only make it worse, is the argument uh, presented. So. And this is the argument presented in uh, America too. Paul Krugman, which is a uh, the Keynesian guru, writes in the New York Times every day, virtually, about what's going on in the economy. Only last week said, what we need is a bit more unemployment so that we can stop wage rises from going up, accepting the Phillips curve argument. But it doesn't hold. In fact, it doesn't hold. Marx explained this back in 1865. He had a debate with a trade unionist called Western, at the International Working Men's Association, the first international, they had a, an official debate. Marx came along and Weston, Thomas Weston on the other side was, presented the argument that we shouldn't, as trade unions, be pushing too hard on wage prices because we'll cause uh, employers to increase uh, price rises and we'll be self-defeating. Marx said, that's not true. It's not true empirically and either it's not the case because what matters in, is the relationship between wages and profits, not wages and prices. So that if you boost wages, you're going to reduce profits. That's what's really going to happen. Now, maybe some monopolists can compensate for that 
by uh, increasing their prices, but the most companies can't do that because they're competing against each other. So wage rises squeeze profits. That's what's really by why it's opposed wage rises, not because of inflation, but because it will mean lower uh, profitability. And the evidence is there, uh, even in the modern evidence of the last year. Corporate profits have been rising hugely, uh, while wages haven't. So that if you want to argue that we need to keep weight prices down, why talk about wage restraint? Why not talk about profit restraint? Nobody ever says that in the media, that we need to get profits down and we need to either introduce windfall profits tax or really control, come, take over companies so that we end this situation where they can uh, decide the relationship between wages and profits. So uh, that brings me actually almost to the alternative, but I, uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. So you can see that the two major arguments presented for inflation, either monetarism, or uh, the wage price spiral driven by excessive demand uh, or full employment, as you put it, those two theories, in my view, don't hold water and they're not empirically correct. And if we're looking at what inflation is happening now, it doesn't seem to be the basis for the rise in inflation we've had in the last 18 months. Okay, thanks very much. And yeah, we'll come back to your sort of alternative explanation in a bit, but first I'd like to just ask you about I'd like to go back to what you're saying about central banks and obviously you're very critical of the central banks and the role that they've played in the past few decades, especially where there's been this big push towards separating central banks and turning them into, from sort of mm. the other functions of government, turning them into these sort of apolitical technocratic institutions that are meant to kind of just guide this level of inflation over long periods of time. And obviously, as you say, they've been very ineffective at doing this. They've not really They've struggled to meet the 2% um, target that they had yeah. for decades, and now they're struggling to keep it, to keep it under or to keep it to the 2% target that they yeah. have. Um, I was just wondering why, why is it, first of all, do you think that they've been so ineffective? And secondly, what do you think is kind of the political motivation between this push towards central bank independence? Well, let's take that last point you make. I mean, Central bank independence is, is one of the features of what we call, like to call neoliberalism. It's the period since the uh, early 1980s, late 1970s, when the idea that we should, that the control of the money supply and control of the interest rates uh, in the banking sector should be taken out of any effort democratically controlled by governments because governments interfere with the needs of the capitalist class, particularly the finance capitalist class. And the first thing we should do is ensure that basically parliament and government has no power really over uh, the control of the money supply. That will be in the hands of the so-called independent central bank. Uh, these independent central banks are only independent of government and the parliament. They're not independent of the banking community and, the, and finance capital in general. Precisely uh, an undemocratic division uh, has taken place to uh, create that situation. And it's part of a policy that was adopted from the 1980s to try and restore the profitability of the capitalist system in general, which had suffered badly in the 1970s, but also to, re to regain control for finance capital over the system, because we don't want all these democratic governments uh, deciding what to do with the money supply. I mean, at the moment, the autocratic leadership of the Turkish uh, government under Erdogan, President Erdogan, he has sacked his central bank governor six times this last 18 months because they keep trying to raise interest rates and control the money supply. And he doesn't want that. He wants, he thinks that we should keep the interest rates lower. He's hoping of course on that basis to stimulate the economy uh, so that he can maintain his position politically. Of course, that's not working uh, because I've just explained it won't work. Uh, and the result is he's got inflation at 60% and the, the Turkish lira doesn't buy you much if you want to buy any, import any, goods from outside. But that's, that's the result of his policy. But he has, as it were, government control, not democratic, because the Turkish parliament has no say in anything. Uh, but <clears throat> it's not controlled by the central bankers. And I can tell you, and I know this every day because I'm still involved in the finance capitalist world to some extent, is that they're just absolutely shocked and horrified by this idea. Let's have independent or finance capital control of the central banks. That's the only way to conduct things. But as we can see, it's not working. 
and it won't work either to meet the targets which the bankers themselves are setting because bank, bankers like low inflation. Why is that? Because they're lending money to you if they can charge 4% interest and inflation only goes up at 2%, that means that when you pay it back, you've, in real terms, you've only got 2% a year redu reduction in what you have to pay back in, from your original loan. But if inflation's at 10 or 20%, when you, so if you borrow 200 pounds, say, and then five years you pay back your 200 pounds, it's worth nothing to the bank if it's inflation has rocketed, they, even if they've made interest rates on it. Uh, they want low inflation so they get a real they get a real return when the money comes back to them in repayment. While borrowers, of course, which are mostly us, uh, in some senses would find inflation useful uh, in, in so far as it reduces the cost of borrowing over time. The problem is, of course, in the meantime, we're having to pay higher prices for everything that we are spending it on. So there's no solution for us either. Um, but from the point of view of capitalism, uh, not not zero uh, prices, which will benefit us all as workers, but a little bit of price rises, but not too much that it damages the bankers' uh, interest rates and returns. And, and that's, if the democratic government is in control of the central banks, there's a real danger that that won't be the case and the bankers will have lost control. So that is why uh, we have these policy of independent central banks introduced not just by pro-capitalist governments, but even Labour governments. In fact, I, I think in the case of the UK, the Independent Central Bank came in under Gordon Brown. Uh, so it's an indication of uh, the general mainstream idea that the solution, it takes away the democratic right of people to decide uh, how the money should be supplied, and it doesn't work. Yeah, this, as well as what we were saying about the wage sort of Pro prioritizing growth of profits over growth of wages kind of shows how this attempt that economists, I think, often have to reduce the economy to sort of a question of management that benefits everyone rather than a question of there are actually conflicting interests at play. And, mm -hmm. and often you have to prioritize one over the other. Um, and I think this situation shows that very well. Um, so another thing I wanted to just going back to what you said about the alternative view, um, going back and speaking of Paul Krugman again, last year, Paul Krugman was famously on the sort of at this point, notoriously out saying that he thought inflation was going to be a bit of a short lived phenomenon, uh, mm -hmm. kind of just growing pangs coming out of the COVID pandemic. On the other hand, now uh, we're seeing people basically arguing that it's um, that is a result of the COVID pandemic and kind of retroactively rewriting history and pretending that this crisis has just kind of just come about, sorry, as a, as a, as a result of the war in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, and arguing that this has sort of just um, been a result of the shock caused by the Russian invasion. Um, now, you argue that basically this is a much more um, a much more kind of deeply rooted crisis and that it's to do basically with uh, a crisis of profitability in yeah. the capitalist system. And I'd like to, if you could just sort of talk a little bit about why you think that is. Well, there are crew and others about six months ago are arguing that inflation was transitory, as you say, because this was a, the COVID shock, as I talked about the global supply chain breaking down and so on and production being reduced. And then we had the Russia-Ukraine war, which added on top to that. So it was a sort of supply shock uh, and therefore would eventually disappear. But of course, Krugman's changed his position because he fears that the price rises that they're seeing, which have lasted longer for all sorts of reasons, the supply chain situation hasn't been sorted, production hasn't really returned to previous levels that we had before COVID. And now we have the war, which is reducing production in key areas uh, and driving up prices. He says this is now going to feed through to wages, and possibly what they like to call inflation expectations. That's the sort of third theory of the mainstream, that once you think prices are gonna rise, you rush out the shops to buy things before they rise and it's self-fulfilling. You just drive up the prices even more. And if inflation expectations rise, then you, you get uncontrolled inflation. Well, the, the semblance of truth in that 
only only relates to the fact that some other inflation must be going on first, and you haven't really explained why that is. If, if people start to rush out to the shops, why are they rushing out to the shops? Because prices have already started rising. It's an excuse for an explanation, uh, and 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 is one that doesn't really hold water. There'll be no inflation expectations rising if inflation objectively wasn't rising anyway. So uh, that argument doesn't hold. But the, the point here is that's his fear now. So that's why he wants to raise unemployment because, as a Keynesian, he thinks the solution is to reduce wage bargaining power, not to do anything about the capitalist profits or, or the control of the that economy. So. Uh, these arguments don't hold, but in a sense, there's truth about the fact that it is transitory in the sense that it's a supply shock. But as you say, Jonas, the supply shock isn't just transitory. It's not just due to the global supply chains. It's not just due to the uh, war. It's also due to the fact that capitalism is not growing very well. It's very slow in its production and investment. And that's because profitability on average we know there are big profits made every day. We read about them in the, in the newspapers by the big companies. But our average across the board in the US and the UK, the average company is not making very good profits. Profitability against all the costs that they've invested in has been falling over a period of time. And in many cases, it's very low. And there's something like 20% of companies in the advanced capitalist economies who are making so little profits, they can't even pay the interest on their debt. They're just hanging in there, really. These gen not always small companies either. There's some medium-sized ones. We call these, well, the current phrase is zombie companies. So they're the living dead. They're still there, but they're really dead. They're not investing, they're not expanding and so on. And, and that situation means that productivity growth is low, which means to compensate for what people need, uh, production is just not there. So there is now a tendency uh, for prices to result, rise because of the weakness in production growth, and that's due to profitability. And that's happening before COVID, before the war. That was happening in 2019 and before, the gradual uh, decline in industrial production growth and so on, leading, if people still have money, uh, and the money supply was there, and the people had savings that to drive up prices to some extent. It wouldn't have happened to the levels we've seen now without this supply shock. But what it tells me is that if the supply shock is that we see in global supply chains is resolved, which I think is going to take a long time. And if the war in Russia and Ukraine comes to an end, which doesn't seem very likely soon, but if those things were to happen, say, let's just say by the end of this year and into 2023, then I think we would see a significant subsiding in the inflation rates because underneath the process, actually inflation is been slowing for the last 20, 30, 40 years because capitalism has been slowing. And that's my alternative explanation, that what really drives inflation is the level of uh, growth in productivity, particularly, the, uh, and therefore the uh, amount of money being made both by the capitalists and the workers in wages and in profits so that they can spend. And if that is that growth is declining, then there's not the same spending power hitting the economy even if production is slowing, the value available to wages and profits slows. And so inflation doesn't really uh, accelerate. So we could, and you can see that if you have a recession, what do we mean by a recession? When production collapses, when investment collapses, when unemployment rises, in that situation, you don't get inflation. You get quite often the opposite. You go into, eventually into a deflationary spiral. You can even have a fall in prices. That doesn't happen in modern economies up to now because they attempt to pump, uh, compensate for that by pumping money in or having some fiscal spending to keep uh, a certain level of demand. But it doesn't stop the recession. It just means you don't have a deflation of prices. So I think if we could talk about in the next year or two, assuming the things that I've just mentioned happen, and at the moment, sitting here in April 2022, I see no end to the war and I don't see much improvement in the global supply chain. So these inflationary spiral could continue for quite a long time longer. Uh, and we're going to find huge increases in interest rates now by the, as the central banks try to hit this with their, with their tools. So if you can imagine that um, you, you've got, uh, you're trying to get a, um, something sorted and what somebody's hitting you over the head with interest rates 
uh, at the same time as you're facing a, a problem with overflowing water or whatever it is. Inflation's under control and it's not worked, but you'll find that your cost of living will dramatically rise and you won't be able to borrow and all kinds of things will happen. I don't, the only way inflation will disappear is basically through a slump, by the way, that we're going at the moment, because capitalism can't deal with it in any other way. So my alternative is to say that what that tells you is that what's happening in the production process, the profitability and the investment process is key to whether there's inflation. If those things are going well, then there won't be much inflation. If they're going badly, uh, and the slowly, then there's a tendency for inflation to rise, which is what we saw uh, for a period of time. But when, uh, if you get really badly and we go into a slump, then the inflation will disappear. Uh, so that's how I see the picture. What that tells you for viewers is that it, it comes down to control of the capitalist system again, or the removal of the capitalist system, to be more exact. We don't want to control it, we want to replace it. But it does mean that. What's the best answer to inflation now? Would be a massive public investment program to provide energy, to provide food, to provide all the other basic services that people need uh, that they can meet at a reasonable price and controls over that situation, both in investment production and prices. Such a control and investment program does not exist in any countries and you have to be globally coordinated. So it doubly doesn't exist in terms of coordination after the fantastic coordination that global capitalism had over COVID, which was none. Uh, and uh, so far, over the only thing they could coordinate at the moment is a, a massive military campaign uh, to crush uh, the Russian invasion and to strengthen NATO. That's where they want to spend the money. They don't want to spend the money in climate change, in energy production, in basic services. But that would give us some measure of control over inflation. Until we get that, the only alternative is a capitalist slump. Yeah, thanks for that. Very, very depressing stuff. But <laughs> I guess sort of on the bright side, you could see, we could maybe speak about at the end. What do you think, you know, we know we know what the roadmap out is. We know what we need, to, what needs to be done. What, how can the labor movement and how can the socialist movement fight for this kind of change today? Well, first and foremost, people have to organize in their workplaces. We have to strengthen the trade union movement in this country and elsewhere. But the, the problem with the trade union movement for the last 30 or 40 years is that the industries that um, trade unions movement was strongest in have declined relatively in manufacturing, heavy industry, and other um, previous services. The industries that have grown in employment are pretty non-union. We know them in the media, technology, pharma, uh, finance and so on. Um, we need we need to break through in those areas. I mean, the, the small developments we've seen in the states with Amazon and elsewhere is an indication of what's possible, and that's that's absolutely vital uh, for bringing out a response from the working class and to households to provide higher wages to compensate for these rising prices. That's first and foremost that we have to. It seems to me. Uh, in the workplace is to build the unions. And I think given that there is, call it full employment, I know most of the employment that people have got is crap. I um, mean, you think David, the recently deceased David Graeber called it bullshit jobs. A lot of them were jobs which don't really pay hugely and they don't train you and they don't give you a career or anything, but they're jobs of some sort. People are doing two of them sometimes in order to, do, to make ends meet. But it does mean that there's a certain level of bargaining power which hasn't existed before, which uh, unions could take advantage of if they can. It's going to have to be done locally because we can't really expect the national leaderships of the existing unions to do too much. That's one area. The other area, of course, is political action. Uh, we need to be ar arguing the case for a completely different approach on public investment as opposed to private investment, for democratic control of the institutions the monetary and financial institutions, the banking institutions, and why have we got a situation in the UK, but not just in the UK, of these huge energy companies making billions that they're handing out to uh, their shareholders, and they're not investing in water and environment, water companies, energy companies, and so on, and yet they're allowed to go on making these profits and jack up prices uh, 
and there's no attempt to stop that. We need to campaign on to return to the programs that had been in in place in the in the, in the past five years of bringing into public ownership the energy and utility companies, so that we can begin to have some control over the way that they're pricing things and investing. And they continue to the water companies continue to pollute our rivers and our seas while taking a huge amount of uh, shareholder money to their shareholders and at the same time making their workers reapply for their jobs in some cases that's a situation we politically we can campaign on as well so those are the two areas in the workplace and on the political campaign thanks a lot for that michael and uh yeah i just want to say to finish off here that if anyone is agrees with what's been said today and they want to help fight for this kind of mass movement um, for change, we would urge you to join Counterfy. We work to build the biggest possible movements against austerity, against uh, capitalist crisis, against war, and all these other things. And we do it through mass organizations such as People's Assembly and Stop the War um, and the trade unions. And also, if you agree with or are interested in any of the things that Michael's been talking about today, please do check out his blog at the next recession, the wordpress.org. Uh, so an extremely useful resource, I think, anyway, and uh, yeah, definitely, definitely worth checking out. So, Michael, thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you, Jonas, for inviting me, and uh, greetings to everybody who's been watching or will watch. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.